Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's case is going to be a very recent and ongoing case, but I still wanted to jump on here and cover this case because as of right now, Anna is still missing and people are doing whatever they can to find her. So I wanted to give you guys all the most updated information possible to keep up with this case and everything that comes out as we find out more about what's going on. As always, I will keep you all updated on whenever new information comes out as soon as I can. But with that being said, let's just jump right into today's case. 39-year-old Anna Walsh is a Siberian woman who I believe moved to the U.S. while the rest of her family and many of her friends remain in Siberia. She's married to a man named Brian Walsh and the two have three sons together, the youngest being two years old, the middle being four, and the oldest being six years old. According to friends who still lived in Siberia, the two seem to have a pretty decent marriage. She really only ever spoke highly of her life in the U.S. and never said anything bad about Brian or her marriage. She always talked about how Brian is a great husband and they have an amazing marriage. Anna Walsh worked as an executive property manager at a real estate company in Washington, D.C. However, the family lives in Cahasset, Massachusetts, but she also has a property in Washington, D.C. Because of how frequently she has to travel for her job, she travels pretty much weekly between Massachusetts and Washington, D.C. She lives in Washington, D.C. during the week and stays with her family on the weekend. Weekends. Not a ton is known beyond this about Anna and Brian besides the things in Brian's own history that has come to light because of all of this. So what we know so far is that Brian does have a past criminal history. Nothing violent as far as we know, but back in 2018, Brian went in front of a grand jury on charges of selling fake Andy Warhol paintings on eBay. According to court documents, back in November of 2016, there was a buyer who found what they thought were authentic paintings on eBay. The first were two of Warhol's Shadow series from 1978, listed originally for $100,000. In the ad, the seller included the invoice for the actual paintings from the Warhol Foundation for a purchase price of $240,000. By November 5th, 2016, the buyer signed a contract with the seller that gave the buyer the right to terminate the purchase if they didn't accept the work after seeing it in person. By November 7th, the buyer's assistant flew to Boston to meet up with the seller of these paintings, who, as we know by now, is Brian. They ended up agreeing on a payment of $80,000 for both of the paintings. The check was deposited into Brian's bank account, and $33,400 was withdrawn within the following 14 days. However, by November 8th, the buyer went ahead and removed the paintings from their frames, and they found that there was no Warhol authentication statement Stamp, and the canvas and staples all looked new. So, the buyer came to the conclusion that these paintings were not authentic. They compared this painting to the painting listed in the eBay ad, and they weren't even the same painting. Then, when the buyer tried to contact Brian, he kept delaying and delaying and making excuses for why he couldn't return the money or really talk to him yet. It turned out that a few years before that, a friend of Brian's had purchased three Warhol paintings, two of which were this shadow collection. So, when visiting this friend who is in South Korea, Brian told the friend that he could get these pieces sold for a very good price, so the friend agreed and he let Brian take these two paintings as well as a couple of other art pieces. After Brian took the artwork, the friend could no longer get into contact with Brian. So after not being able to contact Brian for quite a while, this friend actually contacted a mutual friend who was able to meet up with Brian and was able to get back some of the art, but not all of it. So basically what Brian did was he took photos of the real paintings alongside their proof of purchase, and then when the buyer actually came, he gave the buyer a fake version. 
So by November of 2018, he was charged with counts of wire fraud, interstate transportation for a scheme to defraud, possession of converted goods, and unlawful monetary transaction. The buyer, who is later identified as Ron Rivlin, the owner of the Revolver Gallery in California, or the largest Andy Warhol gallery worldwide, he said that Brian is a master manipulator. He described Brian as charismatic, articulate, and professional. He said that after being sold this fake painting, he was very tactile about how to respond. He said that he just knows how to play people and the legal system. He went on to explain, quote, He's a calculated guy. I've bought over a thousand Warhols, and this is the one and only acquisition that got by me. He was that good. What happened to me is telling of Brian's masterful ability to coerce people. He said that he did talk to Anna on the phone when dealing with Brian and all of this, but he said that to him, Anna seemed unaware of his illegal activity. By April of 2022, 47-year-old Brian Wash pleaded guilty to one count each of wire fraud, interstate transportation to defraud, possession of converted goods, and unlawful monetary transaction. After pleading guilty and while awaiting his sentencing, Brian was on house arrest and he was ordered to wear an ankle monitor. During this time, Anna wrote to the judge to show support for her husband, Brian. She wrote, quote, I am writing this letter to you to express my gratitude for having allowed Brian to spend the last eight months at home supporting his children and closest family members. During these eight months, our family was able to be together during many of the milestones. Our youngest son turned one. Our middle son started to speak and our eldest son, who had just started kindergarten when he saw you last, is now only a few weeks away from completing the year and prepping for first grade. He also lost his first tooth. We also experienced some challenges. On December 21st, 2021, my mother suffered a major neurological event which caused heavy hemorrhage. Brian was the one who heard my mother's sighs for help within seconds and immediately called me an emergency. He was quickly able to establish that she was in severe pain and that she needed immediate medical help. My mother was taken to the South Shore Hospital from our home and then transferred to Brigham and Women's where she received treatment and stayed for almost a month until she was stable enough to leave. Now, months later, she has made about 95% recovery and she keeps repeating that she wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her son-in-law, Brian. Not only did he save her life, but he also brought her and the entire family comfort and joy during the course of her illness. He furthermore remained positive and optimistic about her path to recovery, even when my sister and I were scared for my mother's life. He always believed that she would achieve full recovery and would not give up on her even in the darkest moments. During my mother's illness and beyond, Brian continued to be in contribution and focus on charity work, serve as a coach within his Transformational Leadership Academy, continue to take care of his ailing elderly mother, and be there for his sons day in and day out. She went on to write, whether it was walking for World Peace Day in Dorchester or stopping by Pine Street Inn in Boston to drop off food and sanitary supplies, Brian has been teaching our young boys from early age how important it is to share the joy and be in contribution with time and resources. Brian has been working consistently on breaking all of the bad habits of his family, and we are all looking forward to the new chapter in his life. So clearly, Anna had a lot of positive things to say about Brian at this time. However, we find out that the things between the two of them may not have been very great in the weeks before Anna's disappearance. So, this case starts on New Year's Eve of 2022. According to Brian Walsh, him and his wife Anna hosted a dinner with their friend Jem. He arrived at around 8.30 p.m. and stayed until around 1 or 1.30 a.m. Jem would later come out to say that that night, Anna and Brian's house was very festive and the couple made them an elaborate meal. They stayed up till midnight and toasted to the new year, as you would do on New Year's. When he left their house, he hugged both of them goodbye and then went back home. He said that throughout the night, there was no indication of any issues between Anna and Brian. Anna had been texting friends all night and they had a very fun and normal interaction. 
He said that everybody that night was talking about everything that they had to look forward to in the new year. On the side of a champagne box found in the home, it showed that Anna left an encouraging sweet note for Brian. It reads, wow, 2022, what a year, and yet we are still here and together. Let's make 2023 the best one yet. We are the authors of our lives. Courage, love, perseverance, compassion, and joy. Love, Anna. Brian said that that night on New Year's Eve, Anna went to bed shortly after Jem left. However, before going to bed, Anna had apparently told Brian that she had a work emergency the next day and she had to fly to Washington, D.C. that next morning. So she went to bed and he followed shortly after. That next morning, Anna woke up and got ready for work. She kissed Brian goodbye and told him to go back to sleep before she left for the morning. Typically, when she left for work like this, she would take an Uber, Lyft, or a taxi to the airport. So according to Brian, she probably left between 6 and 7 a.m., though he isn't sure of the exact time because he did go back to sleep after she left for work. Some reports say that it was as early as 4 a.m., but I did only see that in one source, and according to the police affidavit, it was around 6 or 7 a.m. Either way, Brian stated that he eventually got up just after 7 on January 1st, and when he did so, he went to make breakfast for his three young boys. By that afternoon, at around 3 p.m., the babysitter got to the house, and Brian left to go run some errands. As I stated before, Brian was still on house arrest with an ankle monitor, so every trip that he took had to be approved. He said that he went to Shaw's grocery store to get some orange juice and some milk, and then he went back home. This was a quick trip, so he left the house once again by 4 p.m. to go to his mother's house, who lives in Swampscott, which is around an hour and five minutes away, depending on the route that you take. However, on this day in particular, Brian said that he accidentally got onto the wrong highway and he got lost, so it ended up taking him around 20 to 30 minutes longer to get to her house, so about 90-ish minutes to get to his mother's house. He said that within 15 minutes of getting to his mother's condo, he left to run errands again for his mother this time. This time, he said that he went to Whole Foods and a CVS in Swampscott to get groceries and cleaning supplies. He was doing this because his mother had just recently gotten cataract surgery, so he came over and was helping out around the house while she recovered. Brian said that he then went back to his mother's condo to visit with his mom, and then he went back home. Brian said that he returned back home to Cahasset at 8 p.m. that same day. Now, because of this last-minute trip to Washington, D.C., of course, Anna had purchased a plane ticket. However, there was no record on Anna's cell phone that she had ever taken an Uber, Lyft, or a taxi that morning. There were also no records in Uber or Lyft of a driver ever being at her house or near her house to pick her up on January 1st either. Then, the plane ticket that Anna had purchased, that also had not been used. It was also found that Anna's cell phone pinged in the area of their home on Cushing Highway in Cahasset on January 1st and 2nd, after Brian said that she had left for her work trip. By January 2nd, according to Brian, he hadn't been able to find his phone all of New Year's Day. He said that one of the kids must have taken it and lost it on New Year's Day because he ended up finding it on the afternoon of Monday, January 2nd, hidden beneath a pillow. By January 2nd, he said that he spent the day getting ice cream with one of his children while the babysitter, I believe, watched one of his younger children, and then he took one of the other boys to get a chocolate shake at Press Juice Bar in Norwell. Now, that entire time, Brian obviously had not heard from Anna. I don't know if he claims that he tried reaching out to her. I didn't see that in any reports. According to what I did see in a report, she was not reported as a missing person until Wednesday, January 4th. On this day, her work noticed that she had not shown up for work. So, when she no-call no-showed, obviously, that was very much unlike her. Then, it was said that Brian actually called one of Anna's clients to let them know that he hadn't heard from Anna, and the client also had not heard from Anna. 
So this prompted the client to call 911 and report Anna as a missing person. By Friday, January 6th, they started their searches for Anna and they've been going ever since. They utilized sniffer dogs, search and rescue team members, state police, the Cohasset police, and other local police partners to help with the search. They also used drones and helicopters to search from above. Some of the searchers were tasked with confirming parts of Brian's story, including the travel routes that he took on the day that Anna went missing, as well as Anna's own travel history. This is when they found out that Anna did not show up for the airport that day, nor did she get into a Lyft, Uber, or a taxi that day. That is also when police realized that they were not able to confirm Brian's trip to the Whole Foods or the CVS. They found no surveillance video of him there, and they were not able to find receipts from the items that he said that he purchased there. Because he didn't bring his phone with him, saying that he apparently lost it that day, they weren't able to track his cell phone, so I do believe they relied on surveillance video. I haven't seen it posted anywhere if they were tracking him via his ankle monitor, maybe he took it off at some point, I'm not exactly sure, I haven't really seen that stated. I don't know if he was still wearing the ankle monitor at this point, I do know he was on house arrest and he did have to get, again, all of his travels approved by the boards, but I don't know if he was still wearing the ankle monitor at this time. It doesn't sound like he was. Now, like I said, Brian told investigators that he had visited his mother in Swampscott. However, according to his cell phone records, it showed that he also actually visited the towns of Brockton and Abington during that day. Now, like I said, because of his house arrest, he had to get certain places and times approved for traveling outside of his home. He did have all of the trips I mentioned before approved in terms of going shopping and taking his children, taking them for ice cream, as well as visiting his mother. However, these other towns that he visited those were not approved for travel. So investigators came to the conclusion that a lot of what Brian was telling them was not truthful. They believed that they were told these false stories to further delay the investigation for searching for Anna and to throw them off of his trail. So right now we know that there is clear circumstantial evidence that Brian may have been trying to get investigators off of his tail while searching for his missing wife. Using that, we find out even more very damning evidence against Brian and about Anna's behaviors before the disappearance. After the disappearance, Anna's mother came out to talk to the police, saying that she believed Anna and Brian were having problems at home in the weeks before her disappearance. Just one week before her disappearance, her mom reported that Anna actually begged her to come home from Siberia to visit her. Her mom said that she was practically begging her to come that very next day, so she was saying, Mom, please come tomorrow. She said the fact that Anna was asking her to come visit so urgently made it seem to her mom like something must have been very wrong. Then, a friend came forward to talk about how her and Anna had plans to get together just after Christmas on December 27th at her apartment in Washington, D.C. However, on that day, Anna had texted the friend saying that she's going to be working late and she is going to be late to coming over. But then, two hours passed and the friend still hadn't heard from Anna. Anna then called her back, I believe, the next day from her phone to tell her that her phone actually had died that day and she couldn't use her GPS to get to the friend's condo, so she just turned around and went home. They rescheduled their visit for January 5th, but obviously we know that that didn't happen. Then, the friend said that on December 28th, Anna texted her again and told her that she actually got a new SIM card for her phone and that now her phone was working properly again. So, I don't know how much this has to do with the disappearance, but it seemed like, you know, something about her behaviors were changing in the weeks before, so it's just something to note as something that seems out of place. Additionally, in the months before her disappearance, some tenants of Anna's said that they started to notice some changes in her behavior. These tenants were actually friends of Anna's and they said that during these months, she started to act more pushy towards them rather than acting like, you know, they were friends like she always had. 
Then on December 9th, she had actually sold the tenants the condo for cash. So, you know, instead of renting it to them, she was like, hey, do you want to buy it for cash? And she did so. Then she had sold her car in the weeks before her disappearance as well, which did not make any sense to her friends and family. She absolutely loved that car. She was so excited to have it. I believe it was a Maserati, so it was a nice car. So it seemed that all of a sudden, right before her disappearance, she was rushing to sell off all of her assets. Then more came out about Brian's movements after Anna was reportedly last seen. Like I said, on January 2nd, Brian told the police that he went to take his son to get a chocolate shake at the Press Juice Bar in Norwell. However, after looking at surveillance video around the area, cameras actually picked up Brian shopping at a Home Depot in Rockland at around 4 p.m. that day. Video captured him buying $450 worth of cleaning supplies, including mops, buckets, tarps, Tyvex, drop cloths, and various kinds of tape. In the video, he was seen wearing a black surgical mask, blue surgical gloves, and he paid for all of these items in cash. This trip was also not approved by his probation. This entire time, they had been searching for any sign of Anna, but I don't think they found any information as to where she could actually be. However, they did get enough to file a search warrant for the Walsh home, which was executed on January 8th. In the search warrant, police actually found blood in the basement, as well as a damaged knife, which also was said to have blood on it. That same day, police went ahead and searched through the dumpsters outside of the apartment complex in Swampscott, where Brian's mother lives. In that dumpster, police also found a hatchet, blood, a hacksaw, trash bags, used cleaning supplies, and a rug in those dumpsters. Now, I also just recently saw, as I was taking a break literally just a couple of minutes ago, I saw that it was confirmed that Brian was seen on surveillance video by these dumpsters on the same day that Anna went missing. So, that same day on January 8th, Brian Walsh was arrested. He was taken into custody and he was charged with misleading police during the investigation due to his inconsistent statements and obvious attempts at leading investigators in the wrong direction throughout this entire thing. Officials reported that he's actually being fully cooperative, though he is now being held on a $500,000 bail. Something else about Brian that I want to note that I just found out as I was about to record this video is that his father, Tom, actually wrote Brian out of his will. So, back in 2016, his father, and also a doctor who headed the neurology division at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, he wrote that Brian gets his best wishes, but nothing else in his will. A close friend of Brian's father said that Brian is just not a trustworthy person who has stolen money from Tom and has swindled him out of almost a million dollars. Their father-son relationship had been estranged, mostly due to him being a psychopath, according to an affidavit. Apparently, Brian had received psychiatric treatment at the Austin Riggs Center, a psychiatric hospital, where he was diagnosed as a sociopath. Once his father died in 2018, Brian tried to issue an appeal and get possession over some of Tom's estate, but the longtime friend of Tom's vouched for just how bad the relationship between them had actually been. Brian tried saying that yes, they had been estranged, but in the more recent years, the two had reconnected, but the friend said that this just is not true. Tom's friend, who I believe is the executor of Tom's estate, wrote in the affidavit, quote, Brian is not only a sociopath, but also a very angry and physically violent person. So, I do not believe that Brian was ever granted a portion of the estate. I think everything did go to his brother. So, I did just want to add that because that does show Brian's character. He clearly has this long history of treating others like puppets and just trying to use people to get what he wants. There clearly is a lot of evidence here that says that Brian most likely has some sort of involvement in Anna's disappearance. But as of right now, there is still no body. 
They have not found Anna or her body and they are still desperately searching for her. I did try to find a phone number or a tip line or some sort of, you know, source for information that you can contact if you do happen to know anything or if you saw anything, but I wasn't able to find it as of right now. I'm going to keep searching and keep trying to find somewhere where you can give information if you do know anything or if you did see anything. So if I do find a phone number or email that you can contact in relation to Anna's disappearance, that will be listed down below in the description box. But that is all I know about this case so far. Like I said, this is a very ongoing case. There's new information being put out pretty much every single day. So as soon as I find out more information on this case, you guys will be the first to know. I probably will be making more videos on this case in the coming future, but to keep the most up to date with any information that comes out, make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter. I retweet a lot of different news sources that are talking about this case, a lot of different articles. So if you do want to keep up to date with Anna's disappearance, make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I want to know what you guys think. What do you think is going on with this case? Do you think we're going to find Anna soon? And what do you think happened to her? What do you think of Brian's behaviors and all of this evidence that points directly at him? Let me know your thoughts about this and anything else that you think in the comments below. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead, like I said, and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.